chapter 6. I don't know how much we'll cover this morning, but I want to start again at verse 9. Where it says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven. And as I have said in every message that we've done on this, this is the first time that God was ever referred to as our Father. He was the father of Abraham, but they did not think of it as a literal, if I could say that, they thought of it more of an honorable title than an actual uh, relationship. Because when Jesus referred to God as his father, they wanted to stone him. Because they said, thou makest thyself out to be God. Jesus didn't say, I'm God. He referred to God as his father. But the Hebrews knew that each kind brings forth after its own kind. And if Jesus was actually referring to God as his father, as he was, then that made him what his father is. So he was making himself out to be God. Because, in fact, he was. You and I came into this world totally different. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. We were born of flesh. That's how we entered into the world. Now, I know what we were in the mind of God in the beginning, but how we entered into this world was through flesh and blood. And so, our Father, in the natural sense, was not God, but whoever our Father was. And if you want to trace that lineage on down, trace it down to Adam. Or whoever was around before Adam. But Adam was the head. Can somebody say amen? amen? And so, Adam was referred to as the son of God. How many know he was? Because God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Now, I have always preached that the breath of of God was the Spirit. Now, you can read on through Scripture and it talks about the animals having the breath of life. So, in my knowledge of Scripture, I was kind of reaching for my interpretation but then one day I heard that her, there's a lot of the preachers on television that are using the Hebrew Bible. And they've learned how to read Hebrew. I don't know whether it's Benny Hinn or one of them, but I've heard it several times that the word there where, at, where God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that breath of life is twice instead of once. It's a little different than from the animals because it represents God's spirit entering into man. The animals did not have that. They had a soul. They had a, the, you know, animals have an, a, have an idea that they're a being. They may not have the advanced soul that we have, but they know they exist. You feed them. You take care of them. They like you. You don't, they go worse. <laughs> but man, on the other hand, didn't just receive the natural breath. 
That was the one time. He received the breath of life in the Hebrew twice, meaning that what he received was the Spirit of God. God breathed into his nostrils. And, and this was a revelation I got from God. When I looked up the word in, in Acts chapter 2 where it said there were, they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, it was a violent wind. Well, when God breathed into man, it was a violent wind. So that man, what he was receiving there wasn't just natural breath like every other living thing. He received that, but then he received the breath of God, the Spirit of God. God entered into him so that he, trans, he was transformed from just being a natural creature into a spiritual being. But then God said, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat thereof thou shalt die. And when he did, how many know he separated himself from God and became mere flesh and blood. He became what he was before God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Amen. He was dust. But God breathed into his nostrils, and he became something else. But when he was separated from God because he made the wrong choice, how many know he went back to dust? Therefore, whatever he begat, whatever he produced, was simply flesh and blood. And our parents came from that same line. So that God was not our father in that sense. Adam was. Our parents were. But Jesus comes. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he takes on our identity. He don't just take on our sin. He becomes the sinner. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He became us. He who was not guilty became guilty of all the sins in the world. He became that Adamic flesh and blood race. But when he died on the cross, because he died for all, he became the last Adam. After him, there is no Adam. Because he died as the last Adam. Generations have been born who don't have that knowledge. So they still think they're just natural human beings cut off from God. But Jesus changed the picture for all humanity. So that when we would hear the word of truth, telling us what he did for us, and faith cometh by hearing, and we begin to believe, how many know then we begin to experience we're a new species, we're a new creation. And God, who before was not our father, now is our father. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so that we, if he is our father and we are his children, then we have the same seed 
the same spiritual DNA that he has. We are of his kind. We are what he is. And we are a part of him. Amen. Now, when we come to know the Lord, we have no understanding of all that. We just see ourselves as what we, born in, we were born into this world as, flesh and blood creature. And we know we're not able. The law was given to show us we are not able to measure up. To his standards. Amen. We can try and try and try. Somewhere, we're not, we're going to break, break one of the Ten Commandments, let alone the rest of the law. Amen. The rich young ruler thought he had them all down pat till Jesus tested him on the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before thee. The disciples got it. Well, who then can be saved? Jesus said, well, it's impossible for man, but it's possible with God. We come to him, we're a sinner. We're a mess, whether we see ourselves that way or not, amen? But when we believe who and what he says we are and what he has done for us, How many know if we can believe, it's because he's made his entrance into us. Faith is something non-existent within the heart of man. How many know man goes by his senses? If I can see it, if I can feel it, if I can hear it, touch it, then it's real. Oh, but who knows whether there's a God? Who knows what, you know, these are concepts. The natural man can't really get a hold of that. Oh, but let me tell you something. The Word of God has the faith wrapped up inside of it. Oh, hallelujah. So that when we hear the, the Word of truth, when we hear all that Jesus did for us, and we, we find that as we hear that word, there's something that starts to overwhelm us that we start wanting to believe. And as we surrender to that, as the song says, I surrender all. As we surrender to that faith and allow it to work within us, that is evidence that God, through Christ, has come and started making His dwelling in our hearts and in our lives. Can somebody say amen? amen? And he and that is that spiritual DNA, that that seed, that sperm if you please, that impregnates this natural womb of the soul with his spirit and life. And we are like Jesus now, born of God. God is our Father. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, question came up as Ju I'm just as, as Judy was saying, well, if we don't have to be good to be saved, why be good? Because when He comes into us, He changes us, and we become good. We become good because we are what He is. We may not grasp it all at first, and we don't, but it keeps growing. We don't do what we do because of law. We don't even do what we do. Let me say that we don't do what we do just, you know, trying to please God. The fact that we believe pleases Him. And if we believe, we start changing because His grace 
starts influencing us, dealing with us, putting new desires in us, and the things that we do, we don't do because we're trying to earn points. We do because we're seeing that's who and what we are. That's really what we're all about. That's when it becomes reality. And so, the rich young ruler, when he came to Jesus, you know, he, the first thing he said was, Good master. Jesus told him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but God. Do you think by some work of my own, I become what you see? Do you think there's some formula that I have learned that no one else has learned, and if you learn my formula, you can be what I am? You think I've achieved this by my own effort? Why do you call me good? There's none good but God. The reason why Jesus wasn't saying he wasn't good, Jesus was saying what's good is God. And if you see me as good, you're seeing God. How we have taken that religiously and, and been preached from the pulpits, we're no good. Only God's good. And we're just... We're dependent solely on His favor. And we are. But His favor changes us. Because if we're His seed, if we are His child, if He indeed is our Father, then what He is, so are we. And if He's good, guess what? We're good. We're good. Now, there's a lot of the old stuff running around in our mind. Can somebody say amen? A lot of the old vocabulary. But sooner or later, the vocabulary that's not right is going to get weeded out. Because sooner or later, we're going to stop and think, you know, you know, I don't know that, I don't know that this is the way God would talk to somebody. Would he use these type of words that I seem to like to use? And even though I don't mean it, I don't, I don't think God would act mean to somebody. Now, he may, he may, you know, correct some things. He may be stern with some things. Can somebody say Amen. But he would never be hateful. And, you know, and, and would God hold back what he has if he could give and help someone? And if I give, doesn't God give back? So that I'm not going to be depleted from anything because I'm connected to that which cannot be depleted. And more and more we start being moved by compassion. Amen? More and more we're concerned about keeping our word. Being honest, not because we're earning brownie points, but because we recognize we're good. You see, we act up because maybe doctrinally we believe all this, but we act up because somewhere inside we still don't believe we're fully good. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Well, you know, I'm still just a mess. Well, let me tell you something. 
Outwardly, that might be what it appears like. But the real you is not a mess. Quit thinking of yourself as a mess. You'll quit being a mess. It really all focuses on how you see yourself and whether you fully believe who and what he says you are. But if God is your father, guess what? You're good. Because your life is in him. In him we live and move and have our being. And if God is good, we are good. Amen. Outside of him we can do nothing. Amen? But Jesus brought us back together so that today we are in him. What a difference we'll make in this world when we finally surrender. It isn't that we don't believe, it's just we haven't fully surrendered to that faith that's working inside of us. Amen? All oh, praise the Lord. And then when we know that God is our Father, we have a confidence that when we go to Him in prayer, He'll answer. He'll answer. Now, I said this in, in messages that we've preached on this before. God compares Himself to worldly parents. Most parents do want what's best for their children. Amen? There are exceptions. Those who are so controlled by substance abuse or, 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 or things like that, how many know that sometimes because of their addictions or whatever they're in, it, it, it changes them from, from being wanting what's good for their kids. Or it's not that they don't want it, it's just it's so, they're, they're so, so much of a mess. But mostly, most parents want what's best for their children. That's why Jesus said, if you be an evil, now remember, this is before Calvary. Before Jesus redeems us, how many know we're evil in nature? But today, as children of God, we are no longer evil in nature. How many know we have received a heart transplant? I hope this preaching is good for you this morning. Because I know I used to be, I used to hear preaching all the time how we, we used to be browbeaten. Well, you know, you can't trust your heart. The heart is wicked above all. That's, if you read the context... That's the heart that trusts in, in the arm of flesh. Yes. But I don't know about you. How many know we've received a heart transplant? Yes, he said he would remove that heart, put in a soft heart, a heart of flesh. He calls it, but it's a soft heart. He would write his laws upon the tables of our heart and upon our minds in another place. He says, I'll put my spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my ways. Yes. Turn around and never say, I have a heart transplant. Your heart transplant. Then the heart I have isn't evil anymore. Amen? Amen? Yeah, that was the heart that I had before I knew the truth. But when I came to know the Lord, I went through a surgery and that one was removed. But here he's saying, how you, ye being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. And in one place he says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask for it? In another place he says, let me just read it here. I think it's in Matthew chapter 7, or 7. Verse 12, no, it's not 12, it's uh, verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Amen. Amen. When you know that God is your Father, there is a confidence to go up at any level of your maturity. There's a confidence that you can go to your Father and ask him. Now, you may not get everything you want right at the time you ask him. Can somebody say amen? Because we, as I said, I think it was last week or the week before, you know, if your five or six-year-old son comes up to you and asks you for a new car, you're not going to go out and buy him a new car. Well, you know, when he turns 16 and he shows himself responsible, and you're able, how well, you might go out and help him get a car or buy him a car. Well, God's the same way. There are some things we're not ready for when we ask him. And it doesn't mean that we don't, eat, don't receive them, but we have to mature to the level to receive them. But there's a confidence to know that whatever we can have, if we go to him, believing he is our father, he will let us have him. Amen. All oh, praise the Lord. I, that's, that's, that's just review, I know. I do a lot of review. But Matthew, back to Matthew chapter 6 goes on in verse goes on in this verse it says our father which art in heaven if our father lives in heaven guess where we live he is a heavenly being and now so are we we are in these bodies that connect us to the earth but our soul is connected to the invisible dimension as well. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. And we read the scripture how that our citizenship, in the King James, it's a conversation, how our citizenship is in heaven. We live in the United States, and in the natural, we're citizens of this country. And as citizens of this country, we have rights, and I believe that we need to exercise our rights. Can somebody say amen? But our real citizenship isn't the United States. It's heaven. It's the kingdom of God. And what we're wanting to do is, and, and, that, and what we should do is in the rights that we have to vote, Whatever the principles are of the kingdom of God, that's where we should cast our ballots. Amen? Amen. And so, we really need to be responsible who we vote for and realize that they're all going to come to us as angels of light. Amen? Amen? But how many know there are a lot of things, there's a lot of hidden agendas? And when we see things that are contrary to the kingdom of God, then we need not to vote for those areas where, there, where we see things contrary to the kingdom of God. And so, our whole purpose is to take the principles of the kingdom and bring them forth into the earth where the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And how many know that first starts in our own behavior? Amen? Amen. And so he goes into verse 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
as it is in heaven, or what, yeah, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, I know some translations translated on. Uh, maybe some of the other gospels translate it that way. But how many know his kingdom has to come in earth? In earth. It's going to rain on earth. Can somebody say amen? But before it can rain on earth, it has to become a reality in earth. Where is the earth at? This earth. We are the earth in which God's kingdom must rule and must reign. I want to go over to uh, Luke chapter 17. And it's down in verse, verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. There is a lot to be said about that. For one, the kingdom of God is not forced upon anyone. How many remember the story where they wanted to make Jesus king? See, that was a whole... Re the zealots, that's why they... they uh, Judas. Judas was a zealot. And they were impressed with Jesus. But somehow they figured they could use Jesus to further their agenda to free themselves from Roman tyranny. Well, then it became obvious that Jesus didn't operate that way. He said, my kingdom is not of this order. The word world there being the uh, arrangement of things. I do not do things the way you do them. It don't come with observation. It don't come by civil war. It don't come. So the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, pulling down strongholds. Jesus could have did it that way. Uh, he, had, he Look at all the miracles he did. And that's what the zealots were impressed by. If he could do all this stuff, well, he could call fire down from heaven. He could consume the Romans. My, what an ally. But Jesus said, that's not the way I do things. My kingdom's not of this world. It's not of this order. And because he would not become a natural king, join up with them, and go consume the Romans, well then, in fact, that's the whole reason why Judas betrayed Jesus. It wasn't just to get 30 pieces of silver. Was he thought that if they trapped Jesus, got him in the corner, that Jesus would then use his power against them? I know Peter thought that. Remember, Peter raised his sword, chopped off one of the Romans here. What did Jesus do? Turn around and heal the Roman. They all just kind of gave up. That's why Jesus was alone on the cross. Thought, well, he ain't going to do anything about the real problem. Freeing us from the Romans. That's when Jesus 
started talking about how the kingdom is going to come. He said, neither shall they say, lo here, lo there. In our day, we think the kingdom is going to start in some one, in some, in some one location. Let a big revival happen in Pensacola. I'm glad for that revival, and I'm glad for everything it's produced. But the kingdom of God isn't in Pensacola. The kingdom of God is working in Pensacola. Can somebody say amen? Toronto. And this little church, whatever God does with it, this won't be the center of it either. The center of the kingdom is within each individual heart that surrenders. Oh, hallelujah. Each individual heart that surrenders, that's where the kingdom starts. Neither shall they say, lo here, lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Oh, hallelujah. We need to see ourselves as a country. A country that has all kinds of enemies that has held it in bondage. But God has empowered us in Him to rise up and to destroy, bring to ruination, and drive out every enemy that has controlled us. Oh, hallelujah. Spiritually, emotionally, and naturally. Amen. How many know we need to take charge over the things that once ruled our behavior? We're, we're used to just allowing anger to come out, disappointment to come out, depression, uh, or where we're, you know, well, how many, how many know the, all the enemies that, 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 that have controlled us? Accepting things just the way they seem to be. No, there's a new king come to live in this kingdom. Amen? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. And he has empowered us. He hasn't just come into us as king. He set us with him on the throne with him. Yes. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my father's throne. Another way of saying it is, we are joint heirs with Him. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. So that God isn't interested in just ruling over us, but He has set us on the throne with Him, and together we rule in this country. And as we rule in this country, and we begin to see ourselves as we really are, and we start be how many when, when we see him as he is, we become like him, and he is the new person we are. As we start seeing him, hey, this is really who I am. We start being like what we see, and as we do, people around us start noticing the difference. This is how we're separate from the world. Not just by changing our apparel. Although that can be part of it. Can somebody say amen? But it's about being an entirely different person than what we were. And we start making an impact. We start making a change. And as we do, how many know the kingdom 
that's ruling in us then starts ruling on the earth. And the kingdoms of this world start becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. And coming without observation means we ain't waiting for some particular time for this to happen. Though there are times because the Father sees the end from the beginning. Can somebody say amen? So there are times. But as far as we're concerned, we're in the kingdom. We're in the day of the Lord. And every day, the kingdom's here. Every day he is here. Oh, hallelujah. And that's what we're praying. Lord, that thy kingdom come and thy will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Help me to be who I am. I know I have your ability. I know I have your power. But Father, I'm asking you to help me to get a hold of it. How many know we, he has to be involved in everything we do? Even though he's there already, how many know Jesus prayed? Jesus prayed. Well, if he prayed, how much should we pray? He talked to the Father all the time, disappearing to the mountain, somewhere, you know, where he could have a talk with Father. I thought he was a father. Well, when he, he, he also was a man. As a man, he had a human soul, just like we have, but he was a heavenly creature. We need to talk our Father. And we need to ask Him, Lord, help. And how many know we're praying in the will of God? We're abiding. In, we're asking for His kingdom to come into our lives, to help us to change, give us the power we need to start controlling our life and not letting these other things that have controlled it in the past control it anymore. Rise up and take control of our country. Oh, praise the Lord. And then, you know, when we pray and we start seeing our prayers answered and we start walking in that, then how many know that affects our finances, our health, and everything else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, let me just read another scripture. Um, how does the kingdom come? We've already said it. It comes every as soon as we start Believing the word of God and surrendering over to that faith. Ephesians 3.17. I know I've read this hundreds of times. But I need, we need this just drilled into our minds. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. How does Christ dwell in you? By faith. The fact that you believe and trust in Him means something has been produced inside of you because that quality is not in the natural. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Paul said the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ starts dwelling in you, then how many know the king has come to his throne? And as you begin to recognize who he says you are, and you start seeing him as he is, your life 
your will, your desire, what you're all about, how many know then you sit with him on that throne ruling over your land? Oh, praise God. I normally read verse 18. I'm just going to skip that this morning. Go back to Matthew 6. And I'm going to try and close this for today. How many got something out of this this morning? Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. When we... See, this, this prayer is all about priorities. First, we recognize God is our Father. That, then we know we have faith to approach Him. Amen? Amen. And we seek for His kingdom to be established in our lives. That His will be done. Then all of a sudden we start praying for what we actually need right now. Can somebody say amen? There are some things that God has for us as we mature in Him that are beyond our imagination. How many believe that? But right now, let us get a hold of what we need to make an impact on the world today. In our lives, in the lives of those around us. And how many know He's going to give us what we need? I can read a bunch of scriptures on that. I have a bunch of scriptures on that. But, but for the sake of time, how many know we just need to... You know, the, a good picture of that was when the children of Israel were in, in uh, the wilderness. Remember, God caused manna to be on the ground. And they were only to take what they needed for that day. If they tried to t hoard more, it spoiled. On the Sabbath, or on the day before the Sabbath, they were to take a double portion. And that was the only time it didn't spoil. How many know when we rest in God, there's a double portion? Amen. Just take what we need. And trust God every day. Give us this day our daily bread. How many know He's going to answer our prayer? And I'm just going to end this morning with this one. Because the other, I go into 13, that will require going into some other scriptures. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and we went into that I think last week and this is where I'm going to close today how many know that he has already forgiven us while we were yet enemies Christ died for us when we confess our sins to him how many they're already forgiven before we ever go to him it's just good for us to be aware and responsible for our decisions. And when we recognize we've messed up, it's good for us to go before Him and, Father, forgive me. Or thank Him for your forgiveness, but in some way acknowledge. How many of He says, what did He say to do? Not only will He forgive you, because the forgiveness is already paid for, Jesus paid the price, but he said he will cleanse you from all 
unrighteousness so that you're completely perfect before his sight. But the one thing that will bring your sin back upon you is if you fail to have that same nature flowing through you. And we went through the story last week. But you hold, we have been given the power to either remit people of their sins or hold them to their sins. But if we're constantly holding people to their sins, we're being held to ours. And so we pray, Father, forgive our trespasses, forgive our sins as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. One of the greatest attributes of the nature of God is forgiveness. Oh, hallelujah. And how many of we all need it? We all need it from God, and we all need it from each other. Because, you know, we, you can't get through life without either intentional or most of the time unintentionally hurting somebody. And it's good to make it right, and it's good to be forgiven. Amen. It's good to forgive and to forgive. Too. Amen. Yeah, you, yeah, if you don't forgive yourself, you're not going to forgive anyone else. Well, praise the Lord. That's, that's where I'm just going to end it today.